Hello, I am Professor S. Shankaran in the Department of Metallurgical and Materials Engineering. So now we move on to the uh, one more final topic in the high temperature deformation called the super plasticity. We, we did have some introduction about this topic when we talked about uh, right the stress exponent or uh, while discussing the high temperature deformation we introduced a term called the strain rate sensitivity index or strain rate sensitivity and we compared that uh, parameter with the strain hardening exponent also right so uh, so now we will just look at a little more detail uh, about this concept Uh, it's a phenomenon. So, superplasticity refers to a phenomenon in which uh, certain materials subjected to high temperature, typically uh, temperature greater than or equal to 0 0.5 Tm, demonstrate remarkably high strains to failure at strain rates typically in the order of minus 10 to the power minus 3 per second. So, we are talking about material exhibiting remarkably high deformation, uniform elongation, I would say, uniform elongation without a necking. That is called the superplasticity, right? But that happens only with uh, uh, certain conditions. Your temperature of deformation should be in the order of 0 0.5 TEM and then strain rate also should be in the very slow strain rate. And we will later, we will see that it will also have some influence on grain size. Okay. Tensile elongation to failure in superplastic material can be remarkably high, well in the excess of 5000%. So we are not talking about uh, 100 or 200, it is, uh, you know, in the order of thousands. Superplastic behavior correlates with the high strain rate sensitivity exponent m in the constitutive equation. So, the constitutive equation is uh, we have already seen in the high temperature deformation sigma t is equal to k prime into epsilon dot t is the strain rate to the power m. So, you can also recall this uh, you know similar equation we just uh, uh, seen as a fundamental equation. Uh, a basic constitutive equation for a creep deformation where we related the strain rate versus a stress and then stress exponent, right? So it is here, it is stress, strain rate, and then exponent. I mean, strain rate exponent. So they are all very closely related. You can relate that. In general, K prime can be considered a function of strain, but in superplasticity, this is not so. That is, the stress depends only on the plastic strain rate. The exponent m can be determined by conducting a series of tensile tests run at constant low strain rate. So this plot also we have already seen how to determine the uh, m, okay, the exponent. While we looked at the high temperature uh, tensile deformation, we specifically spent a lot of time on effect of strain rate and temperature. In that context, we have already seen this. So, I will not repeat that here again. As the M value of the material increases, it displays a greater resistance to tensile neck development. So, this particular point you have to remember. The, the value of M is an index of its resistance to necking. Okay. So, this point uh, we, we discussed already, but you have to uh, keep in mind. The, depending upon the value, you can just have a, a assessment about what mechanisms it will follow. M also will differ from the mechanisms we will see. This can be illustrated by substitution of F by A, force by area for sigma and epsilon dot is equal to minus 1 by A times dA by dt. Okay. So, we can rewrite this uh, uh, equations for an appropriate tensile test that will lead to a relationship like this dA by dt is equal to minus f by k prime to the power 1 by m times a to the power minus m m minus 1 by m. So, this is 
value values of m are bracketed between 0 to unity these correspond respectively to a non strain rate sensitive material example some metals at low temperature to newtonian viscous materials for which the stress and strain rate are related linearly so it covers the entire spectrum this just before i just said depending upon the mechanisms right or the, the basic structure that means a non strain rate sensitive materials uh, metals at low temperature will behave you know highly brittle so that means same strain rate sensitivity is zero that's why it says zero to unity right zero to unity also on the other hand if m is equal to one then the material will be behave like a Newtonian uh, flow. It will adopt Newtonian flow. Okay, the Newtonian stress material. So this is very important. So one extreme to other extreme, 0 to 1, M value. For the later, M is equal to 1 and that Ta by dt is equal to minus F by K prime. That is the reduction in cross-sectional area per unit time is a constant along the gauge line. So this is very interesting. So there is no necking. So then what happens? So the cross-sectional area, the reduction in cross-sectional area per, per unit time is a constant, okay, along the gauge length when m is equal to 1. Very interesting point. So how the m is determined? There are two ways. Alternate ways of determining a material's strain rate sensitivity m. The first is uh, stress versus strain rate plot. In a steady state flow, stress is determined as a function of strain rate and the logarithmic uh, plot yields a slope m. So this is uh, a well-known idea. On the other hand, a strain rate versus sigma. So this also we have looked at in the creek deformation, right? So if you the basic constitutive relation, I said, you can write it in two forms. That is, sigma is related to strain rate and strain rate related to sigma. So, both the, both the terms have the exponents. So, this is what it is. So, m is nothing but, I mean, m prime is nothing but uh, 1 by m. That is what it is. So, so in, in the... B, the creep testing gives a steady state creep rate as a function of stress. So typically in a creep, uh, creep test, you will get this. And then here it's a high temperature tensile test, you will get that. The a logarithmic plot gives a slope of M prime, which is equal to inverse of M. Most superplastic materials do not display an M value of unity. Rather, M is typically between 0 0.3 to 0 0.8. And an M value of 0 0.5 is commonly associated with superplasticity. Nevertheless, these values of M are sufficiently high to impart a strong resistance to neck development and enhanced tensile failure strains. The parameter M can, in fact, be correlated with the tensile fracture strain in a wide variety of materials as indicated in the figure. Yeah, this we have seen that. So, what does this plot shows? This plot shows the uh, sigma versus uh, strain rate plot for a superplastic material. So, the superplastic material going to involve this kind of uh, uh, behavior. So, this curve is uh, divided into three regions, region 1, region 2 and region 3. Region 1 and 3, the strain rate sensitivity is fairly low. Um, yeah, so the plot is shown here. Before I, I, I just read it before I show the plot. So this plot is M versus uh, strain rate plot. So you can see that uh, sigma versus strain rate sh shows three regions. And M versus strain rate shows also uh, three regions. And... Uh, the strain rate sensitivity for region 1 and region 3 is fairly low, whereas it is high in the superplastic region 2. So only in the region 2, the strain rate uh, sensitivity index is high. So that means this plot, this region, steady state region. Okay. 
So this is one. Uh, so as indicated in A, increases in temperature or decreases in grain size shift sigma versus uh, epsilon dot curve downward and to the right. So increases in temperature and decreasing in the grain size is shifting the curve downward and to right. So it is coming down and then shifting to the right. So this is how the, uh, the influence of temperature and grain size on this uh, uh, superplastic behavior is shown here. And you can clearly see that, you know, uh, as the grain size increases, you can see that there is an increase in the strain rate sensitivity index. So this is also very important. The same changes produce on a somewhat higher value of M as shown in B. So this is a general uh, behavior of subplasticity and its uh, response to the M. Now we we'll see one uh, example. Several mechanisms that fulfill the requirements noted above are discussed. All have in common that grain boundary sliding in superplasty is accommodated by flow processes. So this is one uh, a typical plot observed for uh, a magnesium aluminium eutectic alloy with the grain size uh, uh, 10.6 micrometer uh, tested at uh, 623 Kelvin. So what is schematically shown in the previous slide, it is also experimentally observed in terms of stress versus strain rate as well as uh, M versus strain rate plot. Okay. So what is that we are talking about? So for this superplasticity, several mechanisms like creep, we, we discussed several mechanisms, right? For superplasticity also, there are several mechanisms are proposed uh, depending upon the experimental condition and the uh, materials and uh, other parameters and so on. And all have in common that the grain boundary sliding is involved, okay? And this is not just grain boundary sliding, but is accommodated by a flow processes. There are different type of flow processes are accompanied by the grain boundary sliding. So what you need to understand is superplasticity uh, mechanism involves primarily grain boundary sliding accommodated with other flow process. We will look at uh, some of the uh, primary mechanisms, which is uh, well known. For, to, for the completion. So this is uh, a grain which is there in the initial state. This is one model. What is shown here is um, the grain is being subjected to uniaxial tension in this manner. And then uh, what is shown here is uh, how this grain boundary um, you know, displacements are accommodated, that's what's shown here. So this is a hexagonal schematic with uh, which also a measure of grain size and the grain volume, the model assumes to be 6.65 D prime and uh, the relative translation of grains, so that these two grains are trying to move up and this grain is trying to come here because of the you know the shear forces acting on this boundary so it goes to the intermediate stage like this so grain one two three four so these interfaces has become like this and finally it becomes like this so what is that we are seeing it's kind of a uh, the grains which are in the horizontal form is now it become a vertical form. It's a kind of a switching, right? a grain switching. That's what the model also describes. Schematic of a grain switching event, relative grain boundary sliding produces a strain in this. Eventually what happens because of this uh, sliding uh, event, without, you know, uh, just by grain switching, it also accommodates the strain of 0.55 according to this model without change in the grain shape so if you look at the individual grain shape 
they are all the same. So without changing the grain shape, it, it is able to absorb so much of energy because of the grain boundary sliding event. However, the intermediate step of the process associated with an increased grain boundary area. If you look at this grain boundary in the intermediate stage, so obviously this is uh, increased and then finally it becomes like that. So, how do we understand this? First, the volume of material that must be transported to effect a given strain via grain switching is about 1 by 7 that are required for the diffusion of cream. So, we are now comparing the uh, creep mechanism because these mechanisms are very close to uh, creep deformation, right? So, this is compared with the diffusional creep. Additionally, the grain switching diffusion distance is reduced by a factor of about 3 vis a vis the diffusional creep distance. And there are 6 such paths for grain switching as opposed to 4 for diffusional creep. See, all these points are, uh, I mean, uh, narrated here to accept the idea of this model. So they compare with the diffusion that what are the parameters, what are the constraints. They compare to this uh, diffusional creep and what is this, uh, uh, what are the microstructural events or the mechanisms or steps which supports the idea of grain switching. That is how you have to look at it. Although these factors are mitigated to a degree by the fact that some of the grain boundaries are at angles of neither 0 nor 90 degree to the tensile axis, thus reducing the effective driving stress for the diffusion flow. The net result that the strain rate for a grain switching is about an order of magnitude higher than for the diffusion rate. The only difference uh, coming out from the uh, diffusional creep, I mean, the sense which is slightly contrast, uh, contrasting uh, requirement is that the strain rate for the grain switching is about is higher compared to the diffusional creep. So the model is proposed basically by Ashby and Verall, considering both volumetric and grain boundary mass transport developed the following equation to describe the grain switching creep rate. So the above mechanism is uh, called grain switching creep rate, which is given by this expression. So, so like we have seen several uh, strain rate uh, during creep. So similarly, they have used this epsilon dot g stands for grain switching, which is approximately equal to 100 times omega. We know the value of what is the meaning of omega and divided by kt d square into sigma minus 0 0.72 comma by t into dl into 1 plus 3.3 .3 delta prime dgb divided by d dl. All these parameters we, 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 we is familiar to us. It's nothing, none of these parameters is new. If you just compare the previous creep mechanisms, all these parameters already we have seen. So we don't have to worry about this. Just to uh, get an idea how this uh, mechanisms are, you know, understood. Just for the completion, I just want to bring all this uh, information so that uh, you can refer it and then read it further if you are interested. The term 0 0.72 gamma by d represents this threshold stress for the grain switching. So the grain switching mechanism is not just going to happen for all the stresses, people are talking about threshold stress, okay. So beyond a uh, certain stress only this is going to happen. If only boundary transport is important, then this term 3.3 .3 delta prime dgb which is greater than the uh, small d into capital DL, okay. So the equation, this is uh, above equation will reduce to this point of the equation. So what happens in the intermediate stage that also we will uh, show here. Uh, so during the intermediate stage before the uh, complete grain switching, uh, what happens? Grain 1 and 2 change their shape from that indicated by the solid lines to that of the dotted lines. So 
first the grain initial grain is uh, like this with the solid line and because of the volume and diffusion flux this becomes like uh, the dotted line in both the cases the solid line becomes uh, a dotted line which is uh, uh, due to the volume flux so which is nicely shown by this arrow you can just imagine which is uh, logically it, it looks very good if you if you really take all this uh, arrow then this uh, dotted line will automatically will emerge that is the uh, good thing about this schematic if you just follow the arrow you will land in the dotted line so the grain one and grain two will become like this and then these two lines if you join then you will get that uh, final switching the shape change is affected by diffusion flow which can take place by volumetric and boundary diffusion so this is a called volumetric and boundary diffusion flux so this is nice uh, schematic so what ashby and verol uh, finally says that you know if you plot the normalized stress versus strain rate and then if you generate this uh, superplastic deformation curve then uh, they divide this region 1 2 3 and associated that into different kind of mechanisms so that's what it is written here the relationship between grain switching dislocation creep and superplasticity as proposed by ashby and verol region 1 is considered dominated by the grain switching and 3 by dislocation creep so the region 1 where the you know it is just above the threshold stress then only the grain switching can takes place so which is involving no large grain elongation no important dislocation motion or cell formation no energy strong or transient in the pure metals much boundary sliding and grain rotation texture destroy so all this small small uh, i mean not small in the sense uh, different parameters microstructural parameters which supports the diffusional accommodated flow so so they propose that the region 1 is dominated by the diffusion accommodated flow which is devoid of all this microstructural effects Okay, no large grain elongation, no um, cell formation, and so on. And in the intermediate uh, stage, there is a two mechanism dominant. So, what is two mechan second mechanism? Second mechanism is a dislocation creep dominant. That means grains elongate, cell form, energy is stored, transients appear, a little or no boundary sliding, texture can be created. So, this is a little high stress. event right so the, that means the dislocation creep dominates here as compared to diffusion so in between the two mechanisms dominate so that is what it is shown here so in in fact this is uh, the slope is also compared uh, between where the you know the dislocation creep contribution is there and the other one is uh, we will see the next one then we will discuss this so this is again m versus strain rate same idea and what is shown here is uh, this is for the lead um, at uh, this data is uh, i mean similar i mean uh, appears to be uh, match very well with this uh, data the grain size is about a micron and then you can see this uh, plot similarly so where you see the grain um, region 2 is here which is both the mechanism is supposed to be uh, dominant the total strain rate is a sum of that due to both processes this yields a high strain rate sensitivity that means uh, so when you say the both dominant so you can see that uh, almost it is you know it is the peak where the strain rate sensitivity is the maximum that's what shown here so it it takes all the way up to maximum to the lower value of this end okay in the transition region and the associated plastic uh, superplastic behavior of lead data used in the calculations are appropriate for lead with a uh, uh, grain size of 1 micrometer at uh, 0.5 tm 
So, uh, what I just wanted to uh, show was that uh, some basic idea about superplastic deformation and their mechanisms, important parameters, and some microstructural features. Just a, it can be just an introduction to the uh, phenomena. All that you have to appreciate is this is also very close to the creep uh, deformation. That's why most of the uh, semi empirical relations, uh, several of them are we have seen, and then this. Uh, deformation is also similar to, I mean, the strain rate expression is similar to one of the uh, creep deformation empirical relations. And this uh, case study of, uh, you know, so plastic behavior of a lead clearly uh, shows the, what, what we have already seen in the schematic and uh, the, this is an actual uh, superplastic behavior. It gives you a, an idea about uh, the phenomenon. This is what my intention. Okay. I will stop here and uh, we will continue in the next lecture. Thank you.